Good evening. Good evening, everybody. See a lot of you guys have joined uh, nice and early. That's good. Thank you so much uh, for giving me some of your time. I'm saying good evening now. It should be good morning or good afternoon, wherever you might be. Uh, Tracy, Kim, Elizabeth, Maury, Ruben, everyone, great seeing you here. Toga, I see you on here as well. Thanks so much for joining. We'll give it a, a couple more minutes and then we'll, we'll get cracking. I'm excited for this one. I'm excited to share one of my favorite destinations with you guys. See, Kim says, good morning from California. I hope you guys are well that side. I hope it's nice and warm there. And tour guys ready for the e-trip to the Serengeti. I look forward to sharing it with you, tour guy. I think, um, tour guy, I think you've been to the Serengeti, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Kim says she wants winter back. I tell you what, the way I'm feeling now, I would take summer any day of the week. It's freezing in Johannesburg. Uh, Toga, you've only been to Ngorogoro Crater. Okay, so I'm going to share some other places with you guys. And um, I think, I hope it's going to blow you away. It, it really has blown me away over the years. Tracy once went to boiling in the UAE. I'm sure it is. I'm sure summers get very hot that side. But um, yeah, the way we're feeling now, especially the, like, the last week or so, it's been very cold in Johannesburg. Mori, Kenya and Amara is my favorite place. I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm going to be a bit biased, I think mainly because of our camp there in Amara. But uh, yeah, I love Kenya as a country. Um, and, and the mass Amara is just absolutely phenomenal. I do think, and um, hopefully, you know, with this webinar, I'll show you why I think if you, if you enjoy the Amara, you're going to love the Serengeti, I can guarantee you. Carving season in the Serengeti is on the bucket list to a guy, long list. Um, yeah, I'll tell you what, the carving season, um, it's very similar to the, um, to the migration side of it in Kenya. It can be quite hard to predict, but the, the, the months that we've been going, that sort of February, March period, especially at Ndutu, which I'm going to be chatting about um, a little bit later, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. And, I think if you've seen the, the, the river crossing side of the, of the migration, you have to go and see the carving side of it just to complete the whole circle. It really is phenomenal. Elizabeth from Toronto, Canada. It's Canada. Uh, Canada. <laughs> um, two guys asked, do we go to uh, or do we gorge? We don't. We actually, we, we, we drive past that. But uh, we, we don't go and visit it. Maybe I'm sort of scratching with the idea of maybe including it. And um, the problem around there is just sort of accommodation and things. That's 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 a big issue. We usually drive past when we go from the crater to um, to Dutu. We we drive past there. I think that's the gorge. Uh, took up, if I'm not mistaken, where um, where basically humans were found. I'm not sure that's the gorge you're talking about. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we, we do drive past there. Yeah. The drive sucks. You know, it, it does, you, you got to take it slow. Um, but I think it's a beautiful drive. I'm going to be sharing some videos with that. Um, we'll be starting in the next minute or so, but I love, I love driving those parts because I just, uh, personally, I feel you, you get a better understanding of where you are in the greater scheme of things, which often with a lot of these places, if you fly from one place to another, it's quick and easy, but you don't really get a sense of exactly where you are. Greetings from Washington, D.C. Denise, great to have you on here. Thank you so much for joining. Um, Denise, we now have to have a chat about um, that bet we had. I think you, um, you might be on the losing side on that one, but we'll... Um, discuss that a little bit further. Guys, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, let me just share 
take that away. Right. Actually, before I share that, let me just open up my my chat box so I can chat to you guys. And okay. Okay, so hope you guys can all see that. I think we can we can start. And I wanted to share this um, this incredible place with you guys, the Serengeti. Now, um, just sort of the the brief chat that we had that we've had now. I'm sure everyone has heard of the Serengeti at some point. You know, whether it's watching documentaries or speaking to wildlife photographers, or nowadays just on social media, you know, on Instagram, and Facebook, and all these things. So Getty sort of always pops up somewhere, and there's a good reason for that. You know, it's it's probably like the better known reserves in the, in the world, and it, it's been a place. That I think we've been running the safari for about six years or so, six six or seven years, um, and I've been running it for the last uh, like this year was my fourth year. And so over time, you know, we, we we've changed the itinerary quite a bit. And, and that kind of happens with a destination, you know, you try and see sort of what works, what doesn't work, how you can improve that particular itinerary. And I really do think now we really have got it pretty much spot on. It's, I think it's a great variety of places that we go to. And it's also a nice duration, like 13 nights um, in total, which, uh, which gives you a good breakaway and also gives you um, the option of adding other safaris that, that we've sort of planned it that way on our calendar that you can then combine and um, the Serengeti with one of our other trips. So to give you guys an idea, we'll, we'll start off, uh, well, I will start off in Johannesburg. You're welcome to come overnight in Johannesburg and spend it with me there. But um, our first destination is we fly to um, Kili Airport, which is in a town called Kilimanjaro. And yes, it does have a view of Kilimanjaro. It's basically, um, I won't say right next to it, but you've got a beautiful view of Kilimanjaro if, uh, if the weather's clear. And we, we, we never used to do this. We, we used to, I think last year, yeah, so, so for the last two years, we've included the nights stay at Kia Lodge in the package. Whereas in the past, we used to just fly in and then hit the ground running. But I really do feel, you know, staying at Kia Lodge the night before, it gives us time. I mean, you can land in the morning, you can land midday in the afternoon or even in the evenings. It just gives us time to then sort of have dinner together as a group. Um, if you rented any camera gear from us, we can hand that over to you. You can sort it all out. But we can also just sort of um, the, like discuss the plans and sort of the itinerary sort of going forward. So I think this first night at Kia Lodge that, that's included in the price, I think it's a, it's a great addition that we've added and just sort of breaks that travel down a little bit more. There's a, like a quick view of the, of the rooms. Um, they've got quite a few rooms in there. It's, it's rustic on the outside, but it really is very comfortable inside. It's got air conditioning. Um, they, there's a beautiful restaurant, a bar area, magnificent pool that you can go and relax. And um, like I mentioned, on clear days, you've got a beautiful view of, uh, of Kilimanjaro. Um, as a backdrop. Now, we'll go and have dinner together here, like I said, and then sort of just discuss the plans, get to know each other, have a glass of wine together, just socialize a bit before the safari then takes off the next day. So the next day, we'll then leave Kia Lodge and start driving towards Tarangiri. Now, again, Tarangiri, we've added, um, we've, we've been doing Tarangiri for the last three years. And beautiful, beautiful park. And the reason we, we, we brought Tarangiri in is, is partly like two reasons. Partly to break that, uh, that drive up a little bit. So the drive to Tarangiri is about, about four hours drive. But then what we'll do is um, we'll stop in Arusha to just to buy some supplies, buy some snacks that you want. I often enjoy taking like um, some nuts or chips with me. It's just nice to sort of and um, snack in the vehicle um, sort of between um, between meals and things. So Tarangiri is our, our first official stop. And if you haven't been there, it is, it is phenomenal. And let me just show you this 
So this is the drive going through this. Again, one of the reasons why I love driving through these areas, you, you actually see the transition. You know, once you get into, uh, into Kilimanjaro, you, like, it's a bit of town life. You have some, some cows and donkeys and goats around. And then as you carry on driving, you start seeing that sort of um, the town life disappear. And you start driving through the, the villages. You start seeing farmlands, a lot of rice plantations, coffee plantations. And it's, um, I mean, very comfortable drive, all, all tar road, all the way. And it really does just give you a sense of exactly where you are in the greater scheme of things. This is um, our camp that we, we stayed. We stayed to, at Ndorbu camp. It's also one of the newest camps um, of uh, the Sikias, the, the company that we use pretty much throughout our stay. Beautiful, beautiful camp. I, I think the, the lodge is only about two years old, two or three years old. So it's still a very new camp, massive rooms, um, and a really great place to, 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 to spend the night. We literally, you know, once we drive from Kia, we'll, we'll take a packed lunch with us. And that gives us time to do like an afternoon safari into, um, into Tarangiri. We usually get there just after lunchtime, so about one o'clock. So from about one till about five, we get to do a, like a, pretty much a full game drive in Tarangiri. Okay, again, beautiful lodge. And um, we'll then spend the night there, have dinner and, and everything there. And then the next morning, we'll do a short little drive in Tarangiri. And then we'll head off to our next destination, which I'll get back to you, uh, or which I'll reveal to you a little bit later on. But Tarangiri, beautiful place, like a spectacular place to, to photograph elephants. And, and that's one of our main focus points. And, one of the things that I love about this itinerary is that we almost focus on different things depending on the, on the destination. So here in Tarangiri, as you can see, the baobab in the background, and massive, massive baobab trees. I mean, I can't think of another destination that I've been to that has so many of these massive baobab trees in a, like, in a park. And like I mentioned, We'll, our main focus here is to photograph elephants with those big baobab trees. You can see images like this. Spectacular place. And it really is, I mean, I, 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 I'm trying to think sort of where else you can photograph elephants with these massive baobabs around. Not many places like that. Again, wide, wide open spaces. That river, the Tarangiri River, very, very productive. And again, you know, this, um, this often depends on the time of the year as well. So this was last year. This year, I mean, if you've been following a lot of the, um, the posts on social media, you would know that this year East Africa had a lot of rain. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen rain like that in my life. It was, without a doubt, the most challenging um, trip that I've ever hosted anyway. Um, purely because of the sort of like double more probably more than double the the annual rainfall that they had in a very very short space of time so each year is different but generally you know this time you might get some late afternoon thunder showers but generally it is still quite dry and a lot of the animals then move towards the the, the river again you know like i said one of our main focus points um are the elephants purely because you know i think tarangiri lends itself to that but also the other destination that we go to is not really what you call sort of elephant viewing areas. You know, they, they are around, but not really in the big concentrated herd that you get in Tarangiri. Just two bulls, um, just having a play. Yeah, the cameras going berserk. Nice area also to shoot nice and wide. Okay, so a lot of these elephants, like I mentioned, will go down to the water, get the, um, the, the drink there. Also often end up 
sort of digging for water. Um, so yeah, that that's a main um, a main focus point in Terengiri. And then from Terengiri, we'll take a drive then to Ngorogoro Crater. Again, I think the Ngorogoro Crater is a name that sort of like that doesn't need any introduction. And there's good reason for that. You know, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful reserve. It is a little bit further, like, like I mentioned, we used to drive all the way from Kia up to Ngorogoro Crater, and that used to be like a six hour, six, six and a half hour drive. And we just decided to just break it up a little bit. Also just to give you that experience of another park in, in um, Tanzania. So we only spent one night at Terengiri, and then we head over to the crater and it's, man, if you haven't been to the crater, it is a spectacular place. I'm just going to show you the speed of, here of, uh, yeah, of when we arrived yeah, this year. Um, the Gorgo crater and it's simply breathtaking. Uh, no matter how many times you've seen it, it is out of this world. Have a look at this. It really is breathtaking. I mean, how is that for a view? It is, it is incredible. I like, I, I never get tired of it. I really don't. So, we, we aim to try and get to uh, the Gorgor Crater around lunchtime. Again, we'll take a packed lunch with us, and the reason for that being is so we can try and get down into the into the crater around about sort of two, three o'clock. Unfortunately, in the crater, like you can't sort of stay out there like after sunset. Like you have to be back at the um, at the camps at about six o'clock in the evening. So we try and maximize that time. We try and get down in the crater at about two o'clock, do a bit of a game drive around there. And then like the following day, we'll spend a full day out in the field again. So again, we'll take packed breakfast, packed lunch with us and just maximize our time in the crater. All right, so that, that's our accommodation in the crater. It is like, and you have to understand it is a little bit more hotel-like. A lot of the, um, the the lodges or hotels there are much bigger. It really caters for, for those numbers. Um, but still, very comfortable accommodation. And what I love about um, Sopa Lodge is that view. Like I said, often you'll, you'll get back into camp shortly before sunset and you get to have that view you know, as the sun is setting. It is purely... It, it's spectacular. It really, really is. And no, I think I think the crater has sort of over time gotten a lot of um, negative publicity. Um, a lot of people saying it's too busy, like too many vehicles. But I really have found over the last four years, yes, you, you can um, you can have a sighting, and all of a sudden, you know, there's twenty or thirty cars there. But if you spend time there, if you if you had to give yourself like twenty minutes or half an hour. Those vehicles disappear. So a lot of the vehicles that come in there literally come in for half a day or maybe one full day, and then they go. So they try and like pack in as much as possible, and that's why we like we try and you know get that afternoon game drive in, and then spend a full day in the crater. The great thing about um, what I love about Topo Lodges as well is your access into the crater is super super easy. So. We'll usually leave camp at about, I think, I speak under correction now, but I think the park opens at about quarter past six in the morning. So we can literally leave like five, 5.45 and get there, like as the gates open, get into the crater while it's still dark and then watching that sunrise. It, it is phenomenal. Now, the, the crater itself, it is like so diverse for a relatively small area. You know, it's, We've got fantastic line viewing, but one of the things that we, we focus on um, or that I try and encourage my, my guests to do in the, in the crater is to, you know, to, to focus on the general game stuff. There's so much general game around there, like zebras and, and gazelles and wildebeest. It is like, it is, it's amazing. Like you literally don't go for a few minutes without seeing anything. And again, just 
scenes like that, you can shoot wide open. Um, like you'll find, you'll find pretty much only elephant bulls in the craters. You don't get those, those, those big girls like you would in Tarangiri. And that's why, you know, again, like the focus shifts according to destination. So here, because you can get really close, unfortunately in the crater there's a strict sort of no off-roading policy so you can't leave the roads but i found that the the road networking is is so good that you don't actually don't need to go off the road sometimes maybe for for predators but like for scenes like this it is it is amazing and it's actually incredible how relaxed those animals are with the vehicle so this is often like what i would encourage my guests also you know because the crater is it's a relatively small area in comparison to the Serengeti. So I, I personally find like a day and a half in the crater is enough. I wouldn't spend more time than that in there because, because of the size of it. But these are the kind of images that we'll try and focus on. Getting up, nice, uh, get, your, get your zebra shots, get your gazelle shots, and get like your nice close-up portraits. Beautiful bird life in there as well. There's crown cranes like this one. There's quarry bastards. Um, so these are the kind of images we'll, we'll focus on there, unless, of course, you, know, you have predators that are doing something amazing. Again, black rhino. So the crater is pretty much the only place um, during the itinerary where um, we have a chance of seeing black rhino. So that's always like one of the, the, the biggest highlights or the biggest sort of um, sightings that, that we look for when we're in the crater. We can get black rhino sightings in there. Phenomenal. The distance from the road, I mean, that always depends. Sometimes you get lucky and you get them right up close to the road. Other times they might be a little bit further away. But what I love about the, the, the crater is you've got that rim all the way around. So you've got that beautiful sort of dark backdrop to photograph against. And I mean, to see black rhino in that kind of environment really is spectacular. I mean, mostly they're more sort of um, thicket animals, you know, dense vegetation uh, and a lot of places like in South Africa you might just see a horn or two ears sticking out but in this open environment it is uh, it is amazing to see them there and uh, obviously the photographic opportunities are incredible. Also a very good place for uh, spotted rahinas. I think this year we actually we got lucky we had like two clans having a bit of a standoff and I think there were about 20, 20 or 30 odd hyenas together which is um, quite remarkable. So. Again, you know, anything is possible in the crater and um, it definitely should be a place that you, you have to add to your, to your bucket list. Again, also great destination to shoot wide. Um, usually, like you could have some moody skies there late afternoon. Um, and it, yeah, it's just photographically so beautiful because it's so open. Yeah, this was um, this year, and you'll, you'll find the crater actually generally because it's so high up, it's, it's almost like an evergreen environment. They've got um, a bit of a higher rainfall than some of the other parts. And, you know, the, that contrast that you get from a photographic point of view is just spectacular. So, this was this year. Um, it was actually a collision of five males that were together. And again, that nice sort of open environment, clean backgrounds. Um, simply, simply spectacular. Okay, and from the crater, we'll then drive to uh, Ndutu. And it's actually, um, we were saying, Elena was saying um, that that drive sucks. <laughs> it's, uh, again, it all depends on the, on the rain that they've had and sort of the, the, the condition on the road. This year, actually, even though they had so much rain, the road like wasn't too bad. I've, I've had it worse, but um, it's a bumpy road and, but it is spectacular. I'm going to show you, just give you a sort of a view of uh, or an idea of what the, what the drive is like. So all of a sudden now you, you'll see, you'll get, there's a lot of um, massive villages on the outskirts, as you can see there. Um, and again, I love that transition where you go, you, you'll start seeing cattle and, and donkeys and goats. All of a sudden, that disappears, and you start seeing the zebras and the plants game, giraffe, things like that. In the crater itself, there are no giraffes. Um, 
So, and the reason for that, like people just reckon they never went down into the crater. I personally haven't heard of any records of them there, but as soon as you, as soon as you drive like out of the crater um, towards Ndutu, you start seeing them there on those sort of acacia woodlands. Uh, Helena says, I should have said it was the least well-maintained road I've had the privilege of driving. <laughs> Elena, yeah, it's, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe we're just a little bit more used to it in, in Africa, um, but it's definitely not, um, not a road you want to be taking a small sports car on, that's for sure. You want to be in a big 4x4. Now, in Dutu, this is for me, like, and uh, again, you know, I, I don't want this to sound bad, but this is where I get excited about the trip. You know, the, the crater is amazing, don't get me wrong, it is a beautiful place. But I kind of feel that if you if you've seen it once or twice, then you you've kind of seen it. Um, you have to go see it, but once you've done it a few times, then I think that is enough. But for me, in Dutu and then the Eastern Serengeti, so the second half of the best of Serengeti safari is where I get extremely excited. You see, th these are um, our rooms. It's a, it's a tented tented camp. Still very very comfortable. You've got uh, a bucket shower. So you just let the guys know what time it's, it's um, the bucket shower is all indoors. So you just let the guys know when you'd like to have a shower, you know, either in the mornings when you come back in the evenings or after dinner. And they'll then put hot water in there for you. And they put drinking water in there for you. The beds are comfortable. But what I love about this is, first of all, where the camp is situated. So it's right on that Ndutu Marsh, which is a fantastic game viewing area. But also when you lie in your, um, in your tent at night, there's very few nights where you don't hear um, animal sounds. So it's often lions, it's hyenas. Um, we heard leopard on a, on a few occasions. So for me, this is, this is so me. I absolutely love it. And you can see there's the, there's the tent again. I think they've got, I think it's about eight, eight tents in total, if I'm not mistaken. So, we, we, I mean, we will still take up the majority um, of the camp. There are, well, they've, they've got a tent next to the dining room where you can then sort of charge all of your, your camera gear. Um, so they don't have plug points in the room, but there's a fantastic charging facility. You can charge your cameras and things there, laptops. And that's usually where we do um, our Lightroom work as well. Again, this is so me. This is, for me, this is what every safari experience should be all about. It's about you know, sitting around the fire and just absorbing that, um, that amazing atmosphere. And like I said, most nights you'll hear lions or, or leopard or hyenas or something calling. It, it's an incredible place. Um, our days here are usually sort of full days. And, um, again, just to sort of bring back the, the history of the safari, we, we started off doing like three nights at Ndutu, then we moved it to four nights, and now eventually we've moved it to five nights. And um, purely because I think it, it's so amazing, you really, you can't get enough of the place. I've, for, for the last two years, I've been running back-to-back -back Serengeti safari, so what's that, 26 days um, of safari non-stop, and I still can't get enough of of that in Ndutu area. So Ndutu is like, like you saw on the map now, it's just below um, the crater. It's about a maybe three, three and a half hour drive on the gravel road. And the reason we um, choose Ndutu is that is generally like where the, um, the carving takes place. Those migratory herds come over to the plains of Ndutu and they go and carve on those plains there. And, sorry. <clears throat> One of the reasons for that being is there's a lot of salt in the soils there. So for the most part, they're giving birth, you know, they get a lot of those nutritions. And then also for the calves, you know, starting off, they get those uh, nutrients just to sort of get them going before they move on again. Now with that um, migration, with all the wildebeest calves that are present, I mean, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of babies on the open plains. And actually that's, does attract a lot of the predators, all right? So your, your lions, your leopard, your cheetah, 
um, even spotted our hyenas. They'll follow those herds. And um, it can be a bit of a roller coaster ride. But you know, when it comes to predator viewing, I don't think there's many places that sort of that beats and do to them. Here you can see a lioness that just came to lie in, in the shade of our vehicle. That's th those are the kind of vehicles that we use during the safari. So it's got a nice little pop up roof that you can close when you travel between destinations. And as soon as, you, um, as soon as you're on safari, then that roof pops up. Also, what we, uh, what we do is that this was our first day in Ndutu. Also, what we do is the, um, that window, that whole frame at the back, that comes out. So from a photographic point of view, it just gives you a lot of space. And you can see there, there are canvas, um, canvas rolls up on there that you can just flap down if, uh, if need be. Guys, if you have any questions, feel free to, to shoot them out. But uh, yeah, and due to, man, it's, um, like I said, I mean, the, the camp is, is very close to the marsh. So it gives us opportunity to leave early, early in the morning. But the great thing about Nduta as well is that you can go off road there as well. So um, fantastic, you can get nice and close to the action. And um, there hardly ever is a shortage of action around, uh, around Nduta. Also beautiful male lions in that area. Um, and again, you know, the, the surroundings that you find yourself in there is just simply phenomenal. Um, so Denise asked, why are the vehicles in Tanzania and Kenya the pop-up kind and not totally open like in South Africa? Um, Denise, that, that's a great question. So um, one of the reasons for that being is, is like in East Africa, quite often you'll be driving between, between destinations. So I mean, like you saw in our trip now, we're driving from Kia Lodge um, to Tarangiri to the crater. So in open vehicles, it, like, it wouldn't be that comfortable. Um, whereas a lot of the lodges in South Africa, you know, you're just based on one particular reserve, not driving sort of between different reserves. Um, I hope that makes sense. But James asked, are there flamingos in Ndutu? James, there are. Uh, and Lake Ndutu, over the, la the last sort of four years, we've had uh, flamingos there. This year was the highest that Lake Ndutu has been in, I think, about 40 years. So we had a lot of flamingos there. The problem we had this year is that we hardly had any days of sunshine. So we had these um, incredible images in mind of, of photographing those, uh, those flamingos as the sun was coming up. But, you know, we just didn't have, it was like overcast a lot of the days, often rain. But yeah, there, there are flamingos there and there are great photographic opportunities there as well. Also, Ndutu is also very well known for the tree climbing lions. And um, I mean, the trees around Ndutu are simply phenomenal. I'm like, I often find myself as we're driving around, I look at every tree and I think to myself, wow, a leopard in there would be amazing. Or imagine a lion in that tree. And, and you know, sometimes you get lucky. We had this lioness, um, she was actually mating with a, there was a male lying in the grass below her. But like one of the most perfect trees that you could possibly find. And again, from a photographic opportunity point of view, it's endless. You can shoot close, you can shoot wide, you can shoot panoramas. Um, it's just phenomenal. Here's another one. Um, male coming up to the female. This is actually just shortly afterwards. Um, yeah, truly, truly, truly spectacular. Uh, so James asks again, um, are the tree climbing lions more prolific in numbers in, in Dutu? or Terengiri or Lake Manyara. Um, James, from uh, my experience, definitely more in Ndutu, just from what I've experienced. Um, I know Lake Manyara, they, they also have them around there. I've seen at, uh, at Terengiri, I've seen once. But from, from personal experience, um, I, would, I would definitely say that Ndutu is the, is the place to be. The only problem, like guys, the only problem that Ndutu has is to sort of like come up with a plan on what you're going to go for because like you can have a scene like this and it, it's amazing and the next day you think geez you know that would be amazing again I'd, I'd like to photograph that again but then there's also other places that you can go to you know to, and i'll show you photos and videos of herds or they're you know, looking for cheetahs or 
it's just too much going on in that place. And that's, it, it drives me mad. I actually maybe want to do like a two weeks of party there because there's so much going on there. Uh, Sanjvi says, hi Sanjvi, great to see you on here. Lovely to see you. Thank you so much. You too. And the trip looks so good. Sitting in London, we're getting a fair bit of information about conservation crisis in the game parks in Africa because of COVID-19 and its implications on tourism. I assume that this is part of East Africa. It's just a vulnerable, it's just as vulnerable from a conservation perspective as the Mara. Sanjvi is spot on. Um, yeah, that, that it is something that we're working on now. For, um, you guys might know we, we're busy with um, some in initiatives for the Mara Conservancy and um, trying to raise funds for them. But yeah, I mean, it, it is a big, um, a big worry in these parts. You know, a lot of these places um, are even sort of kept going by a lot of the private lodges, you know. So, and a lot of the lodges in Ndutu are, um, are seasonal camps. You know, I think there's about maybe, um, I don't know of the top of my head, but I think there's only about there's two or three that I know that are permanent camps that are there all year round. So that puts even more pressure on it. Like a lot of the camps are only there for maybe four or five months of the year, and then they move. Then they move to, you know, as the migration goes on, uh, to the northern Serengeti. So yeah, 100%. It is um, it is a big issue, but, you know, like small things by, you know, like obviously booking these safaris is a big deal, but if you can't travel, just by postponing it um, make, makes a big difference. You know, like the last thing that, that these places need is to is for everyone to cancel their trips. Um, and I'm not just talking from, from our point of view, I'm talking from people on the ground, you know, the, the, the lodges sort of maintaining it, the, 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 the people on the outskirts that work at those lodges that are either guides or maintenance guys, um, everyone benefits from that. So, you know, by promoting safaris to these areas, by postponing safaris, all those small things, it does, um, does definitely make a difference in the greatest scheme of things. Uh, Denise, are your guests using their own cameras or your equipment? So, Denise, the majority of our guests use, um, use their own gear. However, we do have a rental um, sort of department available. So, if you'd like to, um, at the moment, we've got um, Nikon and Canon or Nikon and Canon um, gear that we can uh, um, rent out to you. We are looking maybe at um, sort of over time, you know, the, uh, the mirrorless system gets into place or gets a bit more popular, we can maybe get our hands on some Sony and Olympus gear as well. Okay, again, and you know, like, like I mentioned, so the migratory herds, zebras and wildebeest coming over to, um, to Lake Ndutu or to that Ndutu Plains, it is, it is spectacular. I'm going to show you guys a video a little bit later on. Incredible, incredible, incredible place to, to photograph. And once again, you know, from a photographic point of view, opportunities are endless. Um, Sanjvi asked, what's the best lens combo for the trip? So Sanjvi, I've, I've played around with uh, quite a few lenses over the last four years. And for two years, I used um, a fixed 400 2.8 with, uh, with a 1.4 converter. And then this year was the first year I took a 600 more. I would go, if you had to give me sort of three lenses to, to go with, I'd go something sort of that 500 to 600 more range, 70 to 200 and 24 to 70. Those would be, those would be my three lenses. And um, ideally, you know, like otherwise from a, from a zoom point of view, like, um, I think, I mean, if you're looking at Sigma stuff, that sort of, I think it's what's it, 150 to 600, 100 to 400, 70, 200, 24, 70. I think that, that sort of focal range actually the golden for, um, for this trip. Again, that's, uh, that's one in color. Spectacular. And the, the awesome thing about um, going to Tanzania this time of the year, that, yeah, some afternoons you might get a bit of rain. Like I mentioned, this year was just, I mean, if you look at the Mara everywhere, it's just like rains that they haven't seen in a long, 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 long time. Um, but usually, I mean, you do get a bit of a buildup of rain late in the afternoons. And that gives you that beautiful, nice, dark, stormy um, clouds, which makes a beautiful background. And I mean, who doesn't like photographing in rain? It's an amazing result. And just have a look at those, um, those sheer numbers. It's, 
it's it's staggering it really really is yeah it just gives you um opportunity to to play around you know with the herds often sort of close together you can fill your frame with just zebra or just wildebeest or and sometimes it even combines with a bit of both again nice sort of open plans like from uh, from a photographic point of view it really is a dream like you hardly ever have and um, distractions you've just got this um, sea of grass that uh, it makes for beautiful, beautiful background. And so James says, yeah, um, an idea for raising funds. Park should allow people to prepay park fees in advance so revenue is raised now and to apply when visitors make to the parks over the coming months or years as the lockdown restrictions allow for travel. Thanks very much for asking my question. James, yeah, I agree with that. Um, I agree with that, you know, if, um, but look, I, I, I'm, it's, it's, it's a tough one. Like, I understand that you have to sort of keep the funds going, but just working through, um, you know, with our Mara, it's, it's quite a complex, complex process. Um, I mean, I, I I wish we could sort of say, okay, listen, here's here's the funds and, and go ahead with that. But um, it gets a little bit complicated just to sort of try and keep tabs of, you know, of everyone. And a lot of these places, that they don't have um, advanced sort of computer systems and things in place yet. Um, so I, I totally agree with your, with your idea. Um, it's just, you know, to get the technology side of it in a lot of these parks that are literally in the middle of nowhere. But um, yeah, definitely, definitely great idea. Definitely worth something looking into. Can you do any walking safaris here? Um, can you do any walking safaris here or like in some other parks? Sanjv, uh, unfortunately not. So this is a strictly um, sort of vehicle-based view. And the majority of our days um, on the trip are full days, purely because, like I mentioned, especially at Ndutu and our next place, the Eastern Serengeti that I'm going to get to, um, we really want to just try and maximize your photographic opportunities. Um, I don't know why walking hasn't really sort of taken off in these parts. It could be maybe just from the sort of um, sheer openness of it. And that, you know, they're worried that, you know, people might be seeing each other left, right and center. I'm, I'm not quite sure, but, um, you yeah, know, walking safaris, they haven't really sort of taken off in these parts. Okay. Again, another uh, big male in, um, in Nduti area. This guy is actually part of a coalition that uh, this year they, uh, new guys um, that came into Nduti, nomadic males, and they actually ended up killing a lot of the lions around the Dutu Marsh, which it is very sad, but it's also nature's way of controlling, you know, controlling the population and things. So, so this is the, um, the small marsh at Ndutu, and it's one of the, like, the main water sources in that area. So now you can see why it's so incredible having your camp right next to it, because it's the only bit of water in, a, in that area. All the like the migratory herds they come and drink there and naturally that just um, attracts your your predators the lions often come and drink you even get them sort of jumping across the water so photographically again it is it is super and, and having our camp there you know you have the opportunity of being there first thing in the morning you know, as those predators are getting active but you also then can sort of push the limits a little bit more Sort of in the evenings because you don't have a long drive back to camp. Okay, this was last year, this particular female, her, and I'm not sure it could have been a like a, a sister or a cousin, but both of those females had cubs. So I think there were about eight cubs in total that they were hiding in the marsh. Unfortunately, from um, from reports that I heard and, and tried to go back uh, or went back this year to try and find them, um, and from reports I heard those males had killed all of them, unfortunately. But again, you know, it's, um, we, we as humans, we get emotionally attached. And I mean, I don't want to see it, but it is a way to, uh, you know, to control those numbers. And so last year, I mean, we had 
incredible, incredible, incredible viewing of these guys. It was spectacular. They were at the marsh, so every morning, every afternoon, you could cruise past there, and without fail, you know, you'd get them there. Cheetah viewing at, the, at Ndutu, um, probably, you know, some of the best that I've experienced in Africa. It really is phenomenal. And um, like, there's been a lot of documentaries and, um, and write-ups about the cheetah viewing at Ndutu, and especially for cheetah cubs, you know, it's, um, um, it is a great place to view them. Also, those, those sort of wide open spaces, just, you know, it, it's prime, prime cheetah environment. Again, like I mentioned, you know, it's, um, it can be a bit of a roller coaster ride. Uh, you often get, because you've got such massive herds of wildebeest, you do often get a few babies that get left behind. Uh, and this was uh, one, again, just right outside of camp on our way back in the evening. And um, this little youngster got left behind by the herd. I'll tell you a story now. But yeah, anyway, this, um, this one ended up getting taken down by this lioness. But we had a similar thing this year where we found this, you know, also again, just leaving camp, found this baby wildebeest that had been um, sort of lost, lost the herd completely. And as we were driving, this wildebeest, the baby wildebeest was running behind the vehicle. And I just, so I said to the guy, you know, just try and drive faster because the last thing we want to do is you know, drive this little baby into a pride of lions or something like that. And in the distance, I could see there were four spotted hyenas. And I just, and I mean, at this stage, my guests were already like tears running down. I'm like, oh, please don't, don't happen, don't happen. Drove past the hyenas, and because, probably because it was running so close to the vehicles, the hyenas didn't pick it up. Then there were a few jackals. And again, I was just hoping, please, 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 nothing happened. And like, we went past the hyenas, past the jackal, and eventually, like, there was a massive herd at Lake and Dutu, massive herd of wildebeest. And this mom, out of nowhere, came running towards our vehicle. Baby ran towards mom, and she accepted it as part of, part of the herd. So incredible. I mean, like, the joy in that vehicle was amazing. And whether, you know, whether that was her, her calf or you know, whether she'd, she'd lost her calf or not, um, who knows. But that was a fantastic um, experience. But it does happen that a lot of these calves end up getting lost. Again, cheetah viewing, and you can actually see a bit of raindrops there. So, uh, a great place, like I said, to, to photograph cheetahs and especially cheetah hunting. So, wide open spaces. So, photographically, you know, you, you, you can play around quite a bit. And that's why, I'm, like, we went for the first like few years, we'd go back to the camp for lunch um, and then go out and get in the afternoon. And we'd find a cheetah like this and often sort of looking around and then resting. And we'll say, let's go have a quick lunch and come back. And we'll come back in the afternoon and it should be on a kill. He or she would go on a kill. So we've decided, you know, unless there's really nothing happening, then we'll go back um, for, for lunch. But, excuse me, the majority of the days, we we'll take packed breakfast, take packed lunch with us, maximize our time in the field and spend full days out there. Okay, just, again, just gives you an idea of scale. So this is still in the marsh. Um, and you can see those massive herds coming down to drink. And what those lions will often do is they'll just wait in that marsh there because they know the herds have to come, come and have a drink. Again, it depends on, on the rainfall. You know, if you have a lot of rain, then there's more puddles around everywhere. But generally, at that time of the year, um, the animals would, would come there and come and have a drink. Again, in that marsh, fantastic photographic opportunities. I mean, just have a look at this scene. It's just spectacular absolutely amazing and you can imagine you know what a what a spectacle this is in um, in real life it is i mean like a lot of the time you, you can't actually sort of you can't actually photograph it you know you just got to experience it I mean, just look at as far as you can see there's and i mean we've tried to sort of justify it and, and photos and videos and it just doesn't do it justice
This is a game of those little cubs uh, that we had last year. We really were so spoiled to them. They, they were incredible. And again, you know, like people say that a lot of vehicles and things, a lot of these sightings we had all to ourselves. And you just got to be able to, to wait it out, spend time there. A lot of the people will come there, spend five minutes, take a couple of shots, and then move on. Unless you get other photographers, um, like serious photographers, then um, a lot of the time you just have it to yourself. Huh? Okay, then from Lake and Dutu, we'll do our last stop, which is um, the Eastern Serengeti. Um, very short, well, it's pretty much a game drive there. Um, again, pack lunch, pack breakfast with us. And our final stop is um, Elani Plains, which is also, again, one of the newer um, Masikia camps. Beautiful and the, like the perfect finish to a safari. Nice and modern, big rooms, very, very comfortable, and like really, really fantastic location. And our focus here is those copies, those rocky outcrops um, that, that you get. So a lot of people think of the Serengeti as just sort of flat areas that uh, sort of nothing else happens. And it is that, but you also get these rocky outcrops towards the eastern part of the Serengeti. And, Sometimes, or a lot of the times, you get uh, like lions. Um, we've had leopard on there. Uh, cheetahs go out there sometimes. And a lot of the time, it's a, it's a vantage point for them to sort of to overlook those plains, but also to, just to get rid of some of the parasites, some um, tsetse flies and things that might be around there. Again, here, you know, with those stormy skies, photographic opportunities are absolutely endless. And that's what I would say, you know, like, that sort of 500, even 600 mil range is fantastic for, you know, this close-up portraits, maybe some parts of the crater, but don't discourage like a 70 to 200 or even a 24 to 70, especially for these, these rocky areas. It gives you an idea of how close you can get there. There's a pretty good sort of road networking um, around those rocky outcrops. Um, so you can get pretty close and a lot of these um, images we ended up shooting with like a 70 to 200 or 24 to 70. Okay, you can get a bit close. So this is now with a with a 400 mm lens. You can get a bit close, but I just, especially when you have those dramatic clouds, I think those those wider shots really are golden. Something like that. Um, you know, we had lions popped up um, on this rock every day for like three days and. Just, then it just becomes a waiting game. Just wait for them late afternoon. They go down to have a drink or as soon as they start to go hunting. So again, it all comes down to patience. And if, you, if you're willing to spend full days out in the Serengeti, I can guarantee you, you're going to be rewarded. Okay, also again, tutor viewing. And like, I think this year, yeah, this year was the first year we, um, we discovered a place called Gold Copies. Now, it, it's, a, it's a sort of private area where you pay, um, we've included it, it's an extra $20, nothing really, $20 a day. Um, and then you get sort of, it's a private conservancy almost. And this area used to be um, used for cheetah breeding back in the day. So I haven't experienced a place with better cheetah viewing than here. I think um, I have to get the numbers. I can actually get you the numbers now, but it's, um, I'll tell you now how many how many cheetahs we saw. I actually made a made a um, sort of note of it. Wait just a second. Thirty-five. Thirty-five cheetahs and the majority of that, well all of that was in Dutu and um, and Eastern Serengeti. So thirty-five cheetahs in is it five and four nights. So we spent four nights at the last camp. So in nine nights. 35 cheetahs, that, that's pretty impressive. Not, not bad going. <clears throat> okay, I mean, look at, look at that scene. How can you, how can you not, uh, not love it? Denise asks, what's the photographic skill range of your guests? Can you deal with beginners shooting with a DSLR? And Denise, 100%. And so we actually had two people, three people this 
no, sorry, yeah, two people this year who have never, they don't own a camera, they've never used a camera before. They rented uh, cameras and lenses from us and we taught them from, from, from scratch. So 100%, like from beginner, you know, even if you've never picked a camera up in your life, to intermediate, to professional, um, everyone, everyone can, um, can take part. And even if, you know, we've, we've even had, had couples and I often laugh because you, you have one, either the husband or the wife that's into the photography, but the other half is not. I guarantee you, your partner, even if it's with, even if it's with your phone, if your partner is not interested in photography, they are going to be taking photos, they are going to be taking videos, even if it's with their phone. And it's, it's all about the experience, you know. It's, um, so how we do it, so the, the safari we run with only six guests, um, and there'll be two, um, two other guides. So it's myself and Mike, um, and then also myself and Trevor, the second one. But we do it in two vehicles. So you only have um, three guests per vehicle plus a guide. So it's only four people per vehicle. Gives you a lot of space and also makes that one-to-one um, that -one tuition so much easier. The one downside with, um, with this particular safari is that we don't, get, um, we don't get to do a lot of Lightroom stuff. Pretty like I mentioned, we spend full days out in the field. But that you can always do afterwards. You know, we've got um, online one-to-one -one tuitions now. So you can always catch up with those things um, down the line. But from the photographic side of it, we'll help you hands-on from, um, from the minute you get there. Great to know. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be an aperture expert. You don't have to be any expert whatsoever. We'll help you. That's why we're there. That's why we go along. And we pride ourselves in that, uh, that training side of things. Okay, again, the lions, they are simply magnificent. Big manes, dark manes, beautiful, beautiful lions in the Serengeti. Okay, again, um, it's not just the copies, you know, there are sort of other amazing sightings in between, which we don't sort of disregard. Even though our main focus would be to find lions on those rocky outcrops, there's also a lot of other things happening um, around. This year, Again, because of the rain, we like we couldn't access a lot of those uh, a lot of those rocky outcrops. But it is like I said, it, it's uh, it's it's rains that you know some of the people that have been guiding there for 30, 35 years have never seen before. So it really was um, extreme circumstances, but we still had amazing sightings like this this year. It just gives you an idea. No, so also the, those herds, depending on you know, the time of the year or what, um, if you do the first or second trip, um, the herds could move. And generally they'll move then from that Duty area towards that eastern Serengeti and then they'll start heading north. But I mean, it's massive numbers. And again, the video hardly ever, um, hardly ever does it justice. But it, if you drive through these herds, it's literally all around you as far as you can see. And a lot of the time, you know, I, I truly feel a lot of the time that is not even, it's not even photographable. You just got to sit there, maybe like video with your phone, but just sit there and you're part of one of the greatest natural spectacles or wildlife spectacles on the planet, the Great Migration. And it's, uh, it truly is a blessing or a privilege to be a part of. As that's... That's me, hey? That's, that's pretty much it. I'll see if you guys have any questions. Um, let me know if you, if you want more information on the, on the Serengeti trip. I'm happy to, to email it through to you. But um, yeah, I absolutely just love that place, man. It's, uh, it's, it was the, the last trip, uh, last trip, last trip I, I did this year. And it probably will be the last one for the year for me. So, um, spectacular place and like, really is one of my favorites. It's a, it's a highlight on my calendar each year. And I think also because, you know, just of the diversity, the diversity, each destination, we focus on, um, on different things. And yeah, photographically, it's just absolutely phenomenal. The nice thing with, with this is as well, like we, we have a, we run a, a a best of Kenya trip, which uh, we do Ambuseti, Lake Nakuru, Lake Navasha, 
and the Masa Mara that runs straight into the Serengeti. So you could actually do a month of safari and really get to experience the best that Kenya and Serengeti has to offer. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much for your, for your feedback. Um, you guys are way too kind. Nisa is uh, ready to go. Tracy says, what a wonderful place. My brain is bursting with where to go next. So many places, Tracy, so many places to go to. Um, St. V took me added to the bucket list. You have to. St. V, like you, you were in the Mara. Yeah, you were at a well done Mara camp last year. So you'll have a sort of an idea of, um, of our special East Africa is. Guys, that's it from, uh, from my side. Thank you once again. Uh, thank you so much for your time. There's um, some interesting webinars coming up next week. So I'll share the details with you on my Instagram during the course of, uh, or during the next few days. But just to give you guys a, a sneak glimpse, I'm going to bring back the Your Wildlife Images Reviewed um, series back. But I'm going to bring it onto the webinars. So what it was is like you would send maybe two or three of your images that are processed and, and then we'll have a look at them and sort of work through and see what works, what doesn't work. So next week, I think it's Tuesday or Wednesday, we'll be running a webinar. You can register on it. So keep an eye on my Instagram and we'll let the details know there or also on the wildlife blog and I'll let you know the, the days, the times, then you can register and then email through three or four of your images that you've processed already and we'll review them and um, maybe give you some feedback on your images. So that's, that's one that's um, coming up next week that you can uh, keep an eye out for. Well, I don't see any more questions there. I think that's pretty much it. Thank you so much again for your time. Have a fantastic uh, rest of your day or evening, wherever you might be. And I look forward to catching up with you all next week. Until then, cheers.